Good morning, and welcome to our series, Fine Poetry, Poems That Touch Deeper Chords. Today we introduce James H. Cousins, and we have some biographical data from Wikipedia. James Henry Cousins, 1873 to 1956, was an Irish writer, playwright, actor, critic, editor, teacher, and poet. He used several pseudonyms, including Mac Oisin and the Hindu name Jairam. In 1897, he moved to Dublin, where he became part of a literary circle, which included William Butler Yeats, George William Russell, whom we know as A.E., and James Joyce. Cousins wrote widely on the subject of theosophy, and in 1915 traveled to India with the voyage fees paid for by Annie Besant, the president of the Theosophical Society. He spent most of the rest of his life in the subcontinent, apart from a year as professor of English literature at Keio University in Tokyo, and another lecturing in New York. Towards the end of his life, he converted to Hinduism. At the core of Cousins' engagement with Indian culture was a firm belief in the shared sensibilities between Celtic and Oriental peoples. Cousins was significantly influenced by Russell's ability to reconcile mysticism with a pragmatic approach to social reforms and by the teachings of Madame Blavatsky. He had a lifelong interest in the paranormal and acted as reporter in several experiments carried out by William Fletcher Barrett professor of physics at Dublin University and one of the founders of the Society for Psychical Research. In his The Future Poetry, Sri Aurobindo has acclaimed Cousins New Ways in English Literature as, quote, literary criticism which is of the first order, at once discerning and suggestive, criticism which forces us both to see and think. He has also acknowledged that he learned to intuit deeper being, alerted by cousins criticisms of his poems. In 1920, Cousins came to Pondicherry to meet the mother and Sri Aurobindo. The appreciation is palpable in the following citations. From the future poetry, by Sri Aurobindo. Quote, it will be more fruitful to take the main substance of the matter for which the body of Mr. Cousins' criticism gives a good material, taking the impression it creates for a starting point and the trend of English poetry for our main text but casting our view farther back into the past, we may try to sound what the future has to give us 
through the medium of the poetic mind and its power for creation and interpretation. The issues of recent activity are still doubtful, and it would be rash to make any confident prediction. But there is one possibility which this book strongly suggests, and which it is at least interesting and may be fruitful to search and consider. That possibility is the discovery of a closer approximation to what we might call the mantra in poetry. That rhythmic speech which, as the Veda puts it, rises at once from the heart of the seer and from the distant home of the truth. The discovery of the word, the divine movement, the form of thought proper to the reality which, as Mr. Cousins excellently says, quote, lies in the apprehension of a something stable behind the instability of word and deed, something that is reflection of the fundamental passion of humanity for something beyond itself, something that is a dim foreshadowing of the divine urge which is prompting all creation to unfold itself and to rise out of its limitations towards its godlike possibilities. Poetry in the past has done that in moments of supreme elevation. In the future, there seems to be some chance of its making it a more conscious aim and steadfast endeavor." End quote. The Voice of One I am the voice of one who cries, Lo, I have lived my little day, have looked within a woman's eyes, and seen them covered up with clay. And I have laughed, as well as wept, have found my foes, and made my friends. Through mighty issues, I have slept, and waked to unmomentous ends. Have companied with hope and fear, have followed love's mysterious star, and dreamed it infinitely near, yet found it infinitely far. And I have seen my fairy gold turn all to dull, misshapen lead. And hungry I have been, and cold, and wished me harbored with the dead. And sometimes I have longed to free my soul from all that stains and mars, to taste the quiet in the sea, the peace that lodges with the stars. Two, I am the voice of one who cries, Lo, I have stood besides the deep, and I have watched the twilight skies grow gray with mystery and sleep. While soft clouds held the last of light and furrowed all the sunset way, where bent the silver scythe of night to reap the aftermath of day. And I have heard strange voices speak 
in words half uttered, half withdrawn, while far away a mountain peak put on the vestments of the dawn. And o'er the adoring world there hung great silence as the Lord passed by, and day his golden censer swung across the altar of the sky. Three. I am the voice of one who cries, Lo, here I cannot stop or stay. I am not good, I am not wise. I only follow far away. And seeing not, I yearn for sight, to read the heart of praise or blame, to catch the beam within the light and feel the fire behind the flame. Or, wrapped from all the tyrant hours that write their names in tears and blood, I long to pluck immortal flowers and bathe me in a cool, clear flood and know that thing for which I seek with frustrate fingers blind and dead and turn truth's never-ceasing wheel and from its distaff spin my thread. And so, with ever-watching eyes, I live my life from day to day. I am the voice of one who cries, and crying wander on my way.